This review was originally supposed to be posted in January and then in March, but although I completed both those videos, I didn't feel like really either summarized my true feelings about the MacBook Air M1. Coming from Windows, it's been a huge transition for me trying to not only learn macOS, but use it in my daily life the same way that I've used uh, Windows over the last 10 years. And so this Mac has been kind of a little bit of everything to me. And on a day-to-day -day basis, I might go from completely loving it to completely hating it. And that's why it's been difficult to release this review. But I decided that I'd get this review on paper, tell you what I feel about it, and then follow up with any sort of subsequent follow-ups if my, my feelings change, which I can tell you is probably likely. In the last six months, I've used the MacBook Air for just about everything from web browsing and watching content to office work to making and producing the videos that you're watching here today. And what's incredible to me is how versatile it's been in doing so. Now, in the meantime, I've also used several Windows laptops that I've released videos reviewing them on this channel that have been a little bit more specific with the use cases. And while they might be more powerful for editing video or they might be more thin and light for just doing my web browsing and watching content. And so that split has been pretty distinct for me, and the Mac has fallen somewhere in between. If you haven't heard it enough already, the MacBook Air, like any MacBook, is designed incredibly well. Now, I am coming from Windows incredibly impressed with just how cohesive this design is. It feels like an incredibly premium device. And if I had to compare it to any of the other devices that I'd use, I'd say it's right up there with the Dell XPS line and the Microsoft Surface line. And when it comes to that premium of products, then it's really a matter of preference. I would say that this design has a little bit more maybe polish than those lines, just because it feels a little bit more complete. But if I had a choice, I'd probably go with something a little bit more colorful, like the Surface Laptop, instead of this kind of silver or space gray color scheme, which has just gotten a little bit boring over the years. Hopefully now that we've seen that color scheme, that unique color scheme in the IMAX, we will see that also come down to the MacBook Air in something pretty and unique. My only other big criticism of the MacBook Air's design is the size of the bezels, which honestly, they're not this that large. They're still smaller than the Surface laptops, but I would love to see an increased screen size on this, maybe 14 inches to take advantage of the, the larger footprint. This is still a very, very small, slim form factor to the point where it's easy to slip into just about any bag. But if I wanted something super, super compact, then I go with the Surface Laptop Go and this doesn't quite reach that level of compactness. I would also love to see the 12 inch MacBook from a few years ago make a recovery with a better keyboard and the same M1 chip. That would be my real compact powerhouse PC, but for now, this is perfectly fine. In terms of specs and performance, this is the base model, eight gigs of RAM, 256 gig SSD that comes at, I think a $999 price point, which is absolutely incredible and blows just about every other thin and light laptop out of the water that I've ever used, which is incredibly impressive because not only can I do that same office work, emails and that kind of stuff and get excellent battery life on this, but also I can do video editing on this device and get still around 10 hours of battery life. And I never could do that on a thin and light laptop before. The MacBook Air has basically unchained me from my desk, where previously I had a massive editing station in order to do all my video editing. I can now get up, walk over to my couch, and just edit on my couch, which is incredibly impressive. Now, it's not the only laptop to be able to do that, but it is absolutely the only laptop that can do it without a fan, which I absolutely love. I would love for more devices to be made without a fan in the future. Now, don't get me wrong, this story isn't perfect. I frankly think that the eight gigs of RAM is actually a limitation here because when I'm editing videos on this device and I get to a longer video with, with several 4K videos in the timeline, it actually starts to struggle a lot. And the, the performance becomes a lot less consistent. Sometimes the video works just fine, and sometimes this thing slows down to a crawl to the point where I can hardly even use it at all. And I don't know exactly why that's happening, because Activity Monitor doesn't show uh, Adobe Premiere consuming any more than two or three gigs of RAM, but then when Adobe Premiere proceeds to crash, 
it tells me that I didn't have enough internal memory and that Adobe Premiere was using 47 gigs of virtual RAM. That is absolutely insane and way more than this can obviously handle. Now, some of you might already be yelling at your screen saying, well, duh, of course you can't get great video editing performance out of a thin and light laptop with no fan with eight gigs of RAM. But ironically enough, that's kind of exactly what Apple claimed in their presentation of the M1 Max. Now, granted, they were focused on an 8K video editing stream for Final Cut Pro. And while I tried Final Cut Pro for a little while, I had quite a bit of difficulty on it as well. I really don't think Apple should have really blown up the performance of this, where in reality, we're still limited to kind of the same laws of physics that applied before. Eight gigs of RAM is seems to me not enough to edit 4K video streams on this device. And obviously it's still happening through Rosetta. There's still a translation layer. And so that could be an also another haircut to performance. But I really think this is a RAM limitation and a limitation with the way that Apple's handling swap memory between the storage and, and the RAM. Anyways, what bothered me about this wasn't necessarily that I couldn't edit video on this device because most of the time I could, but the inconsistency meant that I had started editing a video on this device and by the time I got to the end of the video where I wanted to finish up and release it, I often would have to switch it to another device in order to finish off. And that sort of inconsistency is really what got to me. Because if I had seen that this device couldn't edit video on day one, then I would have instantly traded it for a 16 gig model and I would have been fine. But now I'm six months in, some of the videos I can edit, some of the videos I can't, and now we're waiting on a supposed upgrade of the M1X or whatever it might be. And now I'm just trying to hold tight to this and wait until we have something more capable. And then I can upgrade to it with 16 gigs of RAM. All right, we're done with video editing performance, just back to the normal performance for a second. This performs absolutely excellent across all applications with a couple of inconsistencies when it comes to the Rosetta translation layer. I still find applications like mail applications running in the background, consuming massive amounts of RAM and slowing the whole system down if they're still on the x86 based uh, design. And that is just a frustration that we're going to have to deal with until more and more applications get translated, which, or gets moved over to Apple Silicon, which have been massive changes in the last few months. One of the big reasons why I went with the MacBook Air over the MacBook Pro is because of the lack of the fan. And while we've seen that the MacBook Pro doesn't really utilize its fan too often, I really wanted to get over laptops that kind of hinged on using the fan as a buffer for how hot they normally ran. And I've just gotten really tired of laptops that kick in the fan every 15 minutes, even if you're browsing Chrome. And so that's specifically why, why I wanted the MacBook Air. Now, it runs hot from time to time, but not typically in normal day-to-day -day use. It's just like an iPad, which feels a lot more modern and like a lot more laptops should be. But we'll have to see if any other laptop manufacturers in the future will switch to fanless design like the MacBook Air. In the past, when people have told me that Mac OS or MacBook trackpads are so much better than any Windows, Windows trackpads, I've frankly kind of rolled my eyes. Because while I perfectly understand that it's big and it's, it's great, I've never really felt like it is that much better than the experience of using a Surface laptop or the experience of using a Dell XPS. Now, after using a MacBook for the last six months, I kind of have opened my eyes. Specifically with Force, Force Touch, I am incredibly impressed with what Force Touch can achieve, and I love that macOS has so much support for it. So for example, dragging a file from one location to another, I can click on that file, drag it to the folder I wanna drop it in, and then click on that folder, rather than having to wait for it to recognize that I'm hovering over it, like I would on Windows. That is one example to a few examples that I've really appreciated with the Force Touch trackpad. The other example that I'd call out is the fact that it has the vibration motor, motor in it, so that when I'm scrolling across the timeline in Adobe Premiere, I can actually feel the cuts between video clips. That is excellent. Now, as far as the kind of normal trackpad use, I think the acceleration of the MacBook Air's trackpad is a little bit wonky for my, you know, what I'm used to. That might be just coming from Windows. And then the gesture navigation or all the, all the swipe gestures, I don't really typically utilize, frankly, for two reasons. First of all, they're not really natural or intuitive for me. Second of all, I really rely more on keyboard shortcuts to navigate between windows or, or programs. And so 
using the, the trackpad is a little bit less native to me. Now, speaking on the keyboard, this keyboard has received a lot of praise from being a massive improvement from older models of MacBook Air and MacBook Pro, the 2016 to 2019 era. And while I completely understand that, I wouldn't say this is a perfect keyboard. In my experience, the travel and the travel is a little bit shallow and a little bit stiff to the point where long periods of typing on this get to be a little bit uncomfortable for me. The real frustration for me when it comes to the MacBook's keyboard is specifically in the layout. Now, let's start with the delete key thing. Now, generally in Windows, you have a backspace key and you have a delete key. One goes back and one deletes forward. And generally, I use both keys quite interchangeably and quite frequently. Now, only having one with a keyboard shortcut to get to the other has been incredibly frustrating for me because maybe it's just this is something that I'm used to, but I wish I had a true delete key in macOS and I found a small solution to get there, but it isn't a full solution. Now, the bigger frustration for me is actually in the whole function control option command framework. After six months of use, I still can't tell you that I've gotten used to using the command key as the primary kind of modifier key for any shortcut within in Mac OS. Now, most shortcuts use the command key, which means that your thumb, I, I assume that your thumb is the primary key that you're using for shortcuts, which means if you're having, you're using a one-handed shortcut with the command key, then you're going to put your, your hand in some very unergonomic positions, getting to whatever key might be on the keyboard. Let me contrast this with Windows, where you have a control key for primarily in-app shortcuts and you have the Windows key for primarily OS level shortcuts. Typically, I am accessing OS level shortcuts a lot less frequently. And so the positioning near my thumb, similar to the command key, is a lot less frustrating. Whereas the control key is perfectly positioned underneath my pinky finger, which I hardly ever use anyways while typing. And so I'm holding down control quite frequently in order to access one-handed shortcuts with, uh, with my left hand. That is incredibly easy, seamless, and to the point where I never have significant ergonomic issues reaching shortcuts with my left hand. This one thing has frustrated me so much that I've literally gone online looking for ways where I can convert my entire keyboard to be more Windows-like shortcuts. But ironically enough, the positioning of the function key, which is also the glow button, I actually use quite frequently in order to switch between the function row and the command keys. Now that takes me right into software. Now again, I'm going to be releasing a more detailed video where I compare Windows and Mac OS, but just some of the highlights. First of all, Mac OS is, in my mind, undeniably more appealing than Windows. It looks significantly better. The colors are prettier, the lines are smoother, something about it just feels a lot more beautiful. With a few exceptions, there's a lot more consistency to the macOS design, and it doesn't feel like it's just an amalgamation of a lot of different operating systems combined into one, like Windows is. Not everything's perfect, though. I would hope that since Apple also makes iPad OS, that notifications on the Mac would be significantly better than those on Windows, where it sucks. But notifications on Mac OS are also quite bad in my mind. I have so many frustrations with these notifications that stay in place versus these notifications that automatically go away. And it doesn't feel natural at all to try and reach for that whole exit button and click it away. It, I don't love notifications on the Mac. Now it's a big deal that my MacBook now supports several iPhone and iPad applications as well, but quite a bit of applications are still not available on the store. Most applications that I would use aren't available on the store. And so iPad apps are really limited here. Window management on macOS, in my mind, is just undeniably worse than the experience on Windows. Maybe that's because it's called Windows, but I still don't get this whole concept of being able to open a program without having any windows open for it. And when you close all the windows for a program, the program doesn't close. I've learned it over time, but still, having to use third-party applications to manage windows, like snapping them back and forth easily, is really frustrating and why Mac OS can't build this sort of stuff natively and never feel like a good window management tool, I don't understand. Now, quick flip to the positives. Obviously, what Apple builds itself on is its ecosystem. And one of the biggest parts of its ecosystem that I've been using is Sidecar. Now, Sidecar 
isn't magic. There are other applications that technically do the same thing, but the seamlessness of Sidecar just seems to be leagues ahead of just about any other service that I've used. And so for that reason, having an iPad side by side with the MacBook and being able to easily stream your screen is amazing. Now on to the ports. Now I was, ironically enough, not too disappointed when I saw that there would be two USB 4 ports on this device. I am not a person that typically uses a lot of ports and I frankly don't mind having a dongle at the ready when I need it for a more traditional USB-A. Despite being labeled USB 4 or Thunderbolt 3 compatible, these are some of the worst ports that I've used on a modern laptop. And there's a couple reasons for that. First, the lack of compatibility. I've struggled to have these like seamlessly connect to any of my docking stations that I have around the house. All of those are USB 3.1 docking stations or one Thunderbolt one. And so I'd expect for all my peripherals to easily connect to this, but often it's kind of this game of reconnecting and connecting certain peripherals from the device until all are recognized by this device. So more often than not, I actually have to utilize both these ports. First of all, for a docking station with my mouse and keyboard, and one for separately a display. And yes, that is only a single display. While one display might be enough for most people, I found that I always use at least two displays when I'm working from home. One is kind of my static display to show my email, my calendar, keep me updated on all the things going on. Whereas one larger display is my primary display for actually doing whatever work that I'm doing. Having only one external display has been such a frustration for me on this device. Before we wrap up, I'll just touch on a couple more things. First, Touch ID is absolutely excellent. It is fast, it is consistent, and it is an excellent solution for logging into my device. Obviously, Apple errs on the side of security here, where it actually asks me for my password more often than Windows would after using Windows Hello, but I'm okay with that. The bigger, small issue that I have with the, window, with the MacBook Air is the fact that the Touch ID doesn't work to easily uh, hop between accounts. When you're at the account login screen, you can't just touch your Touch ID sensor based on, and it will recognize who you are and log into your account. Instead, you have to first click on your profile and then log in with Touch ID. This is a small frustration, but often that click takes a lot longer than you'd expect any modern laptop to. Windows, on the other hand, can easily recognize who's looking at the screen or who's touching the sensor and then log into their respective account. Small difficulty. The other thing that I'd comment is specifically on the speakers. The speakers on this device are absolutely incredible. They're excellent and they make watching content a lot better experience. Wait, I forgot to talk about the display. Okay, really quick. The display of this device is absolutely incredible. Super high res. There is a brightness concern when I'm outside, but it actually is significantly less gloss glossy than the Surface laptop line. The only frustration that I have with it is obviously the lack of a touchscreen. I have way too many fingerprints on this device because just natively, just automatically, when I'm sitting at my laptop and I'm trying to press something really quickly, I will naturally touch the screen because I've been using Windows devices for such a long time. And I would argue that there are a couple instances where this is innately faster. For example, if I'm playing Spotify on my device and I'm just having it sitting by the side while I'm browsing my phone or doing something else elsewhere, it is really easy to be able to just reach up and press the next track button significantly faster than actually going and moving the cursor to the right place and then clicking it. While this is a very, very small example, there are a lot of small examples that add up to touch screens being great. And if you don't want a touch screen on MacBook Air, that's absolutely fine. My question for Apple or my request to Apple is to give me that option. I will pay an extra 200 bucks for the touch screen option. We'll have to see if that actually ever comes. All right, let's wrap this up because it's been six months in the making. After six months of using this device, I can tell you that it is probably one of the best thin and light laptops that I've ever used. It is absolutely incredible, and the fact that Apple's only charging a thousand bucks for it is all the better. Now, is it perfect? Absolutely not. There's still a lot of stuff that Apple needs to fix that hopefully they will in their next generation. And even when that happens, 
it is going to be difficult for me to switch over to macOS completely because not only are those shortcut keys or the keyboard layout, not only am I still stuck to those kind of things, but also apps like Office still feel significantly more usable to me on Windows than they do on macOS. But again, I have a special use case. So for most people out there, if you're looking for around a thousand dollar laptop that will do just about anything for you, it's difficult to find anything better than this. But if like me, you have preferences for Windows 10, then keep that in consideration. Do try this if you haven't already, but don't be afraid to make a choice because you have preferences. Just like before, before Mac had a great breakout product like this, people still chose Mac OS because it, they had the preference of Mac OS over Windows. And now some people will feel the absolute opposite. Thank you for watching NOISO. I hope you liked this video because it was a long time in the making. Let me know down in the comments what you think about the MacBook Air and tell me what the best laptop really means for you and what you're looking for. If you haven't already, be sure to check out some of my other videos on the MacBook Air or other products that I reviewed recently. Thank you for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.